So this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, our well of being Wednesday evening. Such a, yeah, such a treat. So precious to be here together and very grateful to all our friends who show up often. Very grateful for folks we haven't seen in a while or even your first time. Yay! It's awesome. It really, um, it bears mentioning every single time that every single person who is here is truly being generous with their time to support the practice of others here. It, it matters so much. I've heard um, from folks here, and of course, you know, the Buddha said so too. The Sangha matters, right? Our practice together really matters. And it is such an interesting exercise in showing up, kind of gathering this community each week, which looks a little different each week, and trying to create and sustain this field of generosity and kindness together. That's the most important quality I was saying earlier to um, some folks here. The fruit of our practice is kindness. It would be really nice if we also had a calm mind, but you know, that's actually secondary. Calm mind is what allows the kindness. So to really look for the kindness in the way that we can show up, even in this practice. So kindness with ourselves as our mind rages here and there, you know, going to one side of the world and then back and our worries, our ruminations, but also the kindness and really having a sense of what our intention is being here together, remembering that we are here so that we can be more available for those that we care for, for everyone that our network radiates out to. It's such an important aspect of remembering it. And it is very difficult in our contemporary culture, I will say just broadly, to not feel a sense of striving in our practice. Um, striving, I'd say, is one of our biggest obstacles in practice feeling like it should be different, like I should be farther along, or I wish it was like this, or it wasn't like that. And, you know, with the striving, there's this kind of agenda and aggression, right? Ambition can be very healthy. It can help us commit to our practice, do our practice every day, but that striving quality, it's, it's the hungry ghost, right? So for, for folks who know that hungry ghost is such a wonderful um, iconography to to draw from and think about this ghost with a tiny little mouth and a huge belly, right? So never satisfied, always more. And that hungry ghost people associate with specifically addiction, but it's all forms of craving, you know, very much what we're being um, encouraged to do more and more and more and more. So it's so interesting to try to, to meet that hungry ghost attitude and be okay even rejoice in what's actually here. We've been spending now um, almost a year on this beautiful book, Old Path, White Clouds. It's kind of a lot. I was saying we were going to finish it tonight. We might need one more week, I'll be honest. I was like, oh, we can rush through this. And I was like, mm. but um, we are reaching the end of the Buddha's life. And it's yeah, just so sweet um, to hear, especially about his his last hours um, and his last days, but also really poignant and challenging to hear about the struggles that went on in his Sangha. So I've, I've mentioned many times, the reason I love this book, this compiled book by Thich Nhat Hanh of the stories of the, uh, the biography of the Buddha is it also shows us just how human he is and how unfortunately human the situations he was navigating were including treason and threats against his life and betrayal, right? All of this also part of his life. It wasn't just reaching awakening, awakening and deciding to stay by the river and hang out. He didn't actually have to share the teachings, but that imperative then required that he continued over and over to meet with the very real challenges of our world, including war, uh, including greed and hatred. So, that, that's the intrigue for later. But I actually wanted us to start off um, by reading you. I've mentioned it a number of times. There's, it's long enough to be called a story, but it's really a poem by Thich Nhat Hanh. It's called The Story of the River. And the whole story is really about striving and about overcoming striving so that we can be more in our practice. 
So I'd like to read that for all of us, and then we'll go into practice together. We'll practice about 24 minutes or so, then maybe stretch for a moment. I'll ask for questions, discuss a bit on this text, and call it a night. So especially for folks who haven't been here before, so you know what's coming, that is what we will do. So let me start with this, um, this poem or this story. <clears throat> Born on the top of a mountain, the little spring dances her way down. The stream of water sings as she travels. She wants to go fast. She's unable to go slowly. Running, rushing is the only way, maybe even flying. She wants to arrive. Arrive where? arrive at the ocean. She has heard of the deep, blue, beautiful ocean. To become one with the ocean is what she wants. Coming down to the plains, she grows into a young river, winding her way through the beautiful meadows. She has to slow down. Why can't I run all the way when I, like I could when I was a creek? I want to reach the deep blue ocean. If I continue this slowly, how will I ever arrive there at all? As a creek, she was not happy with what she was. She really wanted to grow into a river, but as a river, she doesn't feel happy either. She cannot bear to slow down. Then as she slows down, the young river begins to notice the beautiful clouds reflected in her water. They are of different colors and shapes floating in the sky, and they seem to be free to go anywhere they please. Wanting to be like a cloud, she begins to chase after the clouds, one after another. I am not happy as a river. I want to be like you, or I shall suffer. Life is really not worth living. So the river begins to play the game. She chases after the clouds. She learns to laugh and cry. But the clouds do not stay in one place for very long. They reflect themselves in my water, but then they leave. No cloud seems to be faithful. Every cloud I know has left me. No cloud has ever brought me satisfaction or happiness. I hate their betrayal. The excitement of chasing after clouds is not worth the suffering and despair. One afternoon, a strong wind carried all the clouds away. The sky became desperately empty. There were no more, no more clouds to chase away. Life became empty for the river. She was so lonely she didn't want to live anymore. But how could a river die? From something, you become nothing. From someone, you become no one. Is that even possible? During the night, the river went back to herself. She could not sleep. She listened to her own cries, the lapping of her water against the shore. This was the first time she'd ever listened to herself deeply. And in doing so, she discovered something very important. Her water was made of clouds. She had been chasing after clouds, and she did not know that the clouds were her own nature. The river realized that the object of her search was within her. She touched peace. Suddenly, she could stop. She no longer felt the need to run after something outside herself. She was already what she wanted to become. The peace she experienced was truly gratifying and brought her a deep trust and a deep rest. When the river woke up the next morning, she discovered new and something new and wonderful reflected in the water, the blue sky. How deep it is, how calm. The sky is immense, stable, welcoming, and utterly free. It seemed impossible to believe that this was the first time the river ever reflected the sky in her water. But that is true, because in the past, she was only interested in the clouds. She never paid attention to the sky. No cloud could ever leave the sky. She knew the clouds were there, hidden somewhere in the blue sky. They must contain within itself all the clouds and all waters. Clouds seem impermanent, but the sky is always here, there as a faithful home to all the clouds. Touching the sky, the river touched stability. She touched the ultimate. In the past, she'd only touched something coming and going, being and non-being. Now she was able to touch the home of all coming and going, being and non-being. No one could take the sky out of her water anymore. How wonderful it was to stop and touch. The stopping and touching brought her true stability and peace. She had arrived home. That afternoon, the wind ceased to blow. The clouds came back one by one. 
the river had become wise. She was able to welcome each cloud with a smile. The clouds of many colors and shapes seemed to be the same, but then again, they were no longer the same for the river. She did not feel the need to possess or chase after any particular cloud. She smiled to each cloud with equanimity and loving kindness. She enjoyed their reflections in her water, but when they drifted away, the river did not feel deserted. She waved to them saying, goodbye, have a nice journey. She was no longer bound to any of the clouds. The day was a happy one. That night when the river calmly opened up her heart to the sky, she received the most wonderful image ever reflected in her water, a beautiful full moon, a moon so bright, so refreshing, smiling. All space seemed to be there for the enjoyment of the moon and she looked utterly free. The river reflected the moon in her water and enjoyed the same freedom and happiness. What a wonderful festive night for everyone, sky, clouds, moon, stars, and water. In the boundless peace, sky, clouds, moon, stars, and water enjoyed walking and meditation together. They walked with no need to arrive anywhere, not even the ocean. They could be happy in the present moment. The river did not need to arrive at the ocean to become water. She knew she was water by nature, and at the same time a cloud, the moon, the sky, the stars, and the snow. Why should she ever run away from herself? Who speaks of a river as not flowing? A river does flow, yes, but she does not need to rush. So finding a posture that feels comfortable. Without a rush, seeing if we can find ourselves really connecting to the posture of practice. This posture that balances the uprightness and the vividness of the spine. alongside a softness, a gentleness, and an openness through the front of the body. Softening through the face and the chest and the belly. I'm taking a moment to see if the spine feels balanced and upright, maybe leaning to the left a little and noticing what it's like to lean to the left, off balance, and leaning to the right and feeling that a little off the balance and center, leaning forward, and then coming back to rest in that sense of evenness and balance. allowing a real settling and releasing by continuing to invite relaxation and ease through the face. Softening between the eyebrows and around the forehead. And softening the eyes. Softening through the cheekbones and the jaw. As we hear the sound of the bell to begin the practice, Seeing if we can really receive the sound, sustain our attention of the entire length of the sound as it begins all the way until it lingers towards the end, letting our mind fully rest just there.
establishing ourselves by settling into the body and inviting the quality of stillness. Well, stillness might be experienced simply as not moving or going anywhere. But the stillness as what are we preferencing? Noticing this stability and presence in the body. As we experience the body from within the body, we notice there's vitality and energy and movement. And so this quality of stillness is a choice. Choosing to really focus upon rest into the sense of stillness. And of course, the mind will still get caught up in thoughts and memories and images, movements of the mind, but choosing the stillness, relaxing and releasing whatever captures our attention and returning this choice to return to stillness. Stillness might bring a quality of brightness or vividness, not necessarily falling into a dullness where we just are still, but not really attentive or clear. Finding this beautiful balance between being strung too tight and strung too loose. Feeling our attention at that perfect tautness clear and bright. And the stillness isn't something we need to generate or strive for. Just the natural stillness of the body. Maybe that stillness even starts to help shift the mind.
with the invitation to stillness in the body. And you can then move towards the quality of silence as we settle the speech. That inner narration constantly coming and going, the chatter, the story. And of course, it's still there. But choosing to come in that gap between to the silence. Feeling the presence of silence naturally emerging from stillness. And the silence doesn't mean the absence of other sounds, just the silence that we can choose to return to again and again. It can be helpful to support our silence, to have a light focus on the breath. Attending to the inhale and the sensations of the inhale and continuing to closely attend to the sensations all the way through the exhale. This might be easier to notice at the nostrils or the abdomen or the whole body. Just finding what feels most conducive for you to let your mind fully inhabit this process of attending to breath in order to support the silence of inner speech. Breathing in with a sense of knowing that we are breathing in. And breathing out that same sense of knowing we are breathing out. Not a concept, not an observance per se, just a knowing. while still maintaining this quality of stillness in the body and silence to the speech. We invite and turn towards an openness and a warmth of the mind. That openness and warmth is felt at the heart and throughout our awareness. 
openness and warmth could be experienced throughout the whole body or around the body. It would be almost a feeling or sense of leaning back in the mind instead of leaning forward and getting caught up in making space around, opening up around the contents of the mind. Instead of getting carried away with desire for the clouds like the river, finding ourselves experiencing the vast sky-like nature of mind. Clouds free to come and go, like thoughts and memories and images. Again, when our thoughts, memories, or images arise, see if you can notice that sensation of release and return. Really pay attention to that sense of regaining that vastness after having been caught up in the constriction of thought. Even if there's just two breaths where we feel that freedom of stillness, silence, openness, and warmth, deeply nourishing an entire meditation in one or two breaths. Noticing with at least some aspect of our body, speech, and mind settled into their natural states. There might be more available to us a sense of our goodness that's always already here. 
goodness of our being. Sometimes described as our basic okayness, our Buddha nature, our intrinsic goodness. It might feel like something very subtle, warmth at the heart. Some sense of ease. See if you can notice a presence of okayness that may be a bit more available. It's the very spark of our loving kindness. Our aspiration to find happiness and its causes. Our aspiration to share this happiness. And so to help conjure or fan the flame. Consider that deep yearning and aspiration, which certainly brought us here this evening and to many other forms of practice and study. Inhaling, just feeling the body and exhaling. May I know happiness and its causes. May I feel joy, ease, and peace. Noticing again how it feels through the whole body to invite this quality of loving kindness. The words are just a way, a bridge to help us to the feeling. So one more time, inhaling together, drawing in, and exhaling. May I be truly happy. May I know the causes of happiness here and now. And if we have a little bit of that flame sparked, we can then use that to extend and expand. So inhaling in and exhaling. May all beings know happiness and its true causes. May all beings feel truly happy here and now. Can we generate this care, this kindness, without an agenda, without striving? Just as though we were revealing the true quality of our heart. That deep yearning for our own and others' well-being. And from the kindness naturally springs the compassion, not only to be happy, but to be free from suffering challenges, difficulty. So again, connecting to that heart's deep aspiration, yearning. And as we inhale, drawing in. And as we exhale, may I be free from suffering and its causes. May I feel ease, peace, belonging. Noticing the body and any effect these words and conjuring has on the body. Seeing if we can connect to that heart's feeling. Once again, connecting to that tenderness of our own yearning to be free. 
And exhaling. May I be free from suffering and its causes. May I know peace and ease, love and belonging. And right within that aspiration, finding its most natural radiance to extend to all beings. Inhaling in, exhaling, may all beings be free from suffering and its causes. May all beings know peace and ease, love and belonging. To really allow that to be felt in the heart, but again, without agenda, without an expectation of knowing how that will be. Just the connection of the open heart that cares, desires, the compassion and kindness to touch all beings. Inhaling in once more. May each and every being be free from suffering and its causes. May each and every being know peace and ease, love and belonging. Releasing the words, releasing the concepts, and just taking some breaths here, integrating the body of kindness and compassion with the breath. Breathing in, just feeling the presence of kindness and compassion. And breathing out, feeling the presence of kindness and compassion. Feeling the presence of kindness and compassion, not only within the body, but around the body. From all the beings in this room, mm -hmm. online, and just that presence of our awareness of kindness and compassion, extending beyond the periphery of our body. Kindness and compassion are the very essence of our awareness. And our awareness is not bounded within the body or the mind. So inviting that possibility of feeling the spaciousness and the vastness all around us.
Regathering our attention and awareness to the body. Mm -hmm. Taking a couple slower breaths together to bring our practice to a close. Inhale, extending the inhale and lengthening the inhale. Holding for a moment at the top and extending the exhale gently, slowly. Twice more, extending the inhale. Three, two, one, holding. And gently extending. Three, two, one. And one more time at the rhythm of your own breath. Inhale, extending. And releasing. Thank you for your practice. Yeah. Questions, reflections, comments. If you're in this room and you have a question or comment, please use that mic and online just raise your hand. And because I do see some new faces, I'll just give a kind of invitation that the space that we have here in, in the Dharma Collective is one where we really try to practice that kindness and compassion, both in what we are saying and how we are listening. So for folks who are sharing, really keeping in mind, speaking from the heart, and when we are listening to what's being shared, seeing is how kind we can be in that listening and using this practice of coming together as very radical practice of holding each other actually as though we already are the Buddhas that we are trying to wake up to be, so kind of really seeing each other in that pure way. So now that everyone's a Buddha, who wants to talk? <laughs> but seriously, any questions online or in person, reflections or comments? So now our, our third week of the stillness. Thanks for the heart, Ben. I see it. <laughs> um, any, uh, was our third week of doing the, the stillness, the silence, the openness? So if anyone has any thoughts on that practice or questions? Yes, please. Thank you for doing this. Um, was wondering if you can tell more techniques to keep the vividness besides um, the classical ones, like keeping the spine upright, keeping the gaze up, yeah. Like from your experience or from yeah. your teachers? No? Yeah, great question. Um, I do think the, you know, I'll give a slight preamble. That introspection of being able to monitor our own practice is so huge, right? And even notice when the vividness is falling. And, and vividness is such a tough term, right? But we know what dullness is. <laughs> so it can be helpful for us to find our way to vividness. It's just that sense of things really feeling like precise, present, right? And um, one of the instructions I love uh, from Alan Wallace, which I think is actually from Lung Chempa, but I'm not quite sure, is as we inhale, there's a lot of vividness. And so if we're feeling dull, to focus on the inhale. Have you ever tried that one? 
maybe. Um, Cause I feel like that actually really gives me a sense of brightness. And I really imagine it growing up my central channel. So as I'm in here, imagining the breath, cause I do think it, it's kind of nice to give our mind like just enough to do that can help with the vividness. So imagining it, you know, coming up, you, you could say internally, you know, inhaling vividness or just vividness. So then you have something you're visualizing, something you're saying and something you're doing. So sometimes doing that for a while can really kind of help get back. And you were saying, yeah, the uprightness, you know, some people twist their ear because that makes you wake up a little, right? Um, not probably with earrings in, but that's a like a physiological right way of kind of giving you a brightness. Um, and I do think the gaze up is helpful, you know, like that, but it can create more proliferation of thoughts, right? So it's not, it's a little tricky. That's why we're supposed to gaze down because this is giving us more thoughts. Um, so yeah. Good question. Also practicing earlier in the day, you know, it's very hard at night. Yeah. Other comments, questions, stillness, silence, warm spaciousness. What are you noticing with those are kind of, we're going to go pretty deep with those soon. Um, yay, Grace. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. I'm really enjoying the silence um, and sitting. It, it's being really grounding for me right now. Mm. But what if I'm getting bored or I'm feeling like meditating would make me less of a good person, like a cool person, like it's not cool and I'm bored. Hmm. So wait, let me. <laughs> oh, wait, can I know both questions? One is what do I do if I get bored. Yes. And then. What's um, the second? I'm afraid of how people will perceive me if oh. I advocate for being a good meditator. Oh, yeah, definitely. No proselytizing, sadly. Yes, with the meditation. It it never works. Like I think it's it's so classic, especially when we start feeling the gains that like we want everybody to like get free with us. But um, yeah, it really doesn't work. So I guess, and then the um, not seem cool. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of not cool in a way. But it is, but it's really cool to be totally available for people when they need you. It's like really cool to be able to like be with what's difficult. And I think that ends up, you know, when you end up finding like all your friends and family members asking you about meditation, you know, your practice is going well because they are asking you. Like, how are you able to like do this or be that way um, on the boring? You know, it's so I think it's such a great question because it's so boring, right? But um, I don't know if you remember last week. I think it was last week, Tom, when you were talking about that kind of like getting into a flow a little. It's like there becomes a point. And this is, you know, it's it's the term that is used in the traditions is absorption, um, where instead of it being boring and like, oh, and like, wow, you are so vividly enwrapped in that same process. And I do think that's a combination of actually the stillness, like your body's relaxed enough, your mind is relaxed enough that you actually taste or touch the sense of awareness that is so it's it's like bliss would be saying would almost be like um not descriptive enough like it feels good because you're not so preoccupied you're not so distracted but it feels good and compelling it's compelling was what you said yeah like that sense of like i don't actually care about those distracting thoughts like i am actually compelled by what's happening in the mind but along the way, I think one of the greatest ways to manage boredom is truly, and this is kind of boring, but ca counting the breath. And so, if we're, you know, if you get really like, wow, like I can't, I just, there's, I need something to do. Um, again, part of introspection also might help with clarity for a moment, you know, so inhaling and then the count and just only going to 10, like don't count forever. Some people say 21. I think 10 is totally sufficient. And then going back. You know, so because we don't want to get too reliant and just do like a meditation on counting, but it can help give us again, give our mind somewhere to be so it settles and could become more compelling. Well, thank you. Yes, you're so welcome. <laughs> 
Anyone else? Questions or comments? Friends online? Okay. Oh, Ben, yeah. Yeah. Um, over the past, like, maybe four years, but very sporadically, I've been um, appreciating more and more that my inner speech is not always speech and not always verbal. So, like, I am mm -hmm. a very verbal person. I gravitate towards words, and I like to make them say exactly the right thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I would... I sometimes do this thing where like I quiet the verbal part of my inner chatter and other parts go under the radar radar uh Whoa. mostly music and uh I I'm sort of I mean I'm not like a I, I'm not like a, a a pro musician or anything but I find myself often like uh like composing a found sound kind of composition in my head with all sorts of weird rhythms drawn from whatever's around me and um, that has an energy to it that has yeah. often a restlessness to it and when i notice it i can i can usually volitionally decrease it and like what a difference so that's been interesting for me for the past few years cool very interesting noticing and you're you're totally right inner speech isn't always words right it can also be images that are not verbal right so that kind of other layer or level of um distraction right like you're saying there's a an energy to it that's restless um and so to get subtle enough even that we're not just noticing the thoughts going by as words but this other inner language it, i find it so fascinating to think about you know, this consciousness and the pre-verbal life of our ancestors. Like, what was that like? You know, just amazing to think about thinking without words. It totally happens, but we are so bounded in by words that it's almost hard for us to imagine. And I do think, you know, these meditative or quiescent states, we can start to kind of get into that more subtle level. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. This actually spurs me about, about things that nonverbal thoughts. Like, is it a thought if uh, sometimes I see light dancing on my eyelids? Mm. Like, am I thinking, Am I is that a thought or am I observing something that's just in front of my eye? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's distracting sometimes. Yes. Sometimes I'm just looking at it I yeah don't yeah and I, again i think my, my first question would be like how does it affect your practice right, right? and if it feels like non-distracting some people have amazing visual situations yeah. going on as again as things settle down yeah other phenomena arise mm -hmm. um so i think it's probably not like a thought it, it's so i think you know in this book they call it mental formation Okay. to describe all the phenomena that can arise through the mind, uh, which includes feelings and thoughts, but also images. So is it like if, if I'm attached, if that's distracting me and I'm like, ooh, look at the pretty mm -hmm. lights. Yeah, then it's like then it, not just, helpful. Right, okay. But otherwise, it's not a problem. problem. Yeah. yeah, not a problem. And there's so many varieties of the way people experience the mind settling. Okay. Because it's probably there a lot. You just are not. Yeah. But when my mind settles, I start really, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, there's really, truly no problem. And it can, in some ways be like, it could feel like a confirming sign, like, okay, I'm yeah. more settled in. So yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the difference between this practice and, and the one that we usually do mm. kind of uh, settling the mind in its natural state. Yeah. So for me, this one seems like, like almost like a translation of that other one. Yeah, but in a softer place. Mm. What is the difference? Yeah, it is a, just a different um, translation of the same practice by Wangel Rinpoche versus I, Alan Wallace, right? And but they are both looking at the same primary Tibetan texts, and Alan, you know 
focuses more on the stability of the body and relaxation. And then also the kind of, I know it's funny, I have to go in my head through both three, but, and then the openness and warmth, like there's no warmth in Allen's. And I think the warmth is so critical. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I, we'll get into this more in January, but these are also associated with the different kayas or the different bodies of practice in the, in the Vajrayana. And I think it's really interesting to associate, you know, the stillness with the body of emptiness and the silence uh, with the body of light and then the openness with the body of manifestation. So there's even like deeper layers that we'll go into with these practice. It's, it's so like preliminary, settle body, speech and mind is natural state, moving on. But to really spend time with it um, and especially encouraged by hearing folks really connect with that process of settling and have that stability and you know every meditation in some ways like it 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 contains all the parts and that settling of body speech and mind is kind of in in every meditation might be taught in a different way but how can we move towards any other practice if we don't have that kind of you know alan calls it making the mind serviceable like, what do I need to do to just get my basic level of sanity so I can practice? And so it's really hard, you know? Um, so glad that it feels gentler. You know, Wangyal Rinpoche is coming from the Ban tradition. So that's the indigenous tradition in Tibet that kind of co-evolved with Buddhism. Um, so there's like a little obvious difference there than um, just the kind of form of Tibetan Buddhism that is not as intertwined. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, you guys ready to catch up with the life of the Buddha? Yeah, guys, a lot going on here. Um, I'm gonna skip around a bit in these last chapters for folks who have the book. No problem, if you've never heard of this book, I'll, I'll catch you up. Buddha woke up, got a lot of followers, all over India, changing hearts and minds. And, and truly what the book does over and over is like, bring us back to these essential practices, right? Over and over and over these essential practices. And he is kind of repackaging in a way, a lot of his earliest insights. And there's this beautiful chapter um, called Tears of Happiness, chapter 75. Um, and he is really talking a lot about the very kind of roots of happiness. So he says, this is an interesting way he's describing both happiness and what gets in the way of happiness or false happiness. So the first Dharma talk the Buddha delivered that season was on happiness. He told the assembly that happiness is real and can be realized in the very midst of daily life. First of all, the Buddha said, happiness is not the result of gratifying sense desires. Sense pleasures give the illusion of happiness, but in fact are the sources of suffering. He's gonna pull that back a little, because I know like my dinner was definitely not the source of suffering, right? That, I mean, it could be, it made my tummy hurt, but, um, but you know, he, he likes to use these extremes. So he gives this pretty intense, but it is quite impactful analogy. He says, it is like a leper who is forced to live alone in the forest. His flesh is racked by terrible pain day and night. So he digs a pit and makes a fierce fire and stands over it to seek temporary relief from his pain by toasting his limbs over the fire. It is the only way he can feel any comfort but miraculously, after a few years, his disease goes into remission and he's able to return to a normal life in the village. One day he enters the forest and sees a group of lepers toasting their limbs over hot flames as he just once did. He is filled with pity for them. He knows that in his healthy state, he could never bear to hold his limbs over such fierce flames. If someone tried to drag him over the fire, he would resist with all his might. He understands that what once he once took to be comfort is actually a source of pain to one who is healthy. 
Whoa, heavy. <laughs> so he says, sense, sense pleasures are like a pit of fire. They bring happiness only to those who are ill. <laughs> We're going to take it back a little. A healthy person shuns the flames of sense desires. But then he says, the source of true happiness is living in ease and freedom and fully experiencing the wonders of life. Being aware of what's going on in the present moment, free from clinging, free from aversion. A happy person cherishes the wonders taking place in the present moment. A cool breeze, the morning sky, a golden flower, a violet, a violet bamboo tree, a smile of a child. A, a happy person can appreciate these things without being bound by them. So it's a little different than what he said. It's not just sensory pleasures are a pit of fire. Um, it's how we relate to our sensory pleasures. We can relate to them in a way that makes them, right, this pit of fire. But a happy person appreciates these things without being bound by them, understanding everything is impermanent and without a separate self. A happy person does not become consumed by even such pleasures. A happy person thus lives in ease, free from all worry and fear because they understand that a flower will soon wilt and not sad when it does. A happy person understands the nature of birth and death of everything. The happiness is true happiness and they don't worry about fear or their own death. And you know, it's, it's just so beautiful. Again, this really core teaching here, this idea of transcending birth and death, which doesn't mean that things are not born and die, but transcending our just deep set aversion towards and you know same as if we cling towards something we enjoy that aversion towards death makes death real right so to transcend birth and death is not that we will not die that we are immortal it's to transcend being bound by our fear of death and and then you know how do we do that did it, because he understands that a flower will soon wilt and is not sad when it does. And one of my favorite, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh says this in so many of his teachings and books, is kind of really recognizing the garbage heap when you look at the flower and recognizing the flower when you look at the garbage heap. Like just that process and cycle of beauty and decay and, you know, everything containing the seeds of everything. And again, it's interesting because at the level of phys physics, like Raph brought up a couple weeks ago, it's true, right? Like we do contain everything of all time. Uh, but this, that way of seeing the world gives us so much peace and ease. You know, that the idea of like, yeah, non-separateness and impermanence. But like, what is that like when we encounter every single thing in our life? a good cup of coffee, a friend, someone we don't like. Like, how do we make that seeing real? And it's deliberately practicing it. So it's interesting because, you know, sense enjoyments are definitely worth living for, right? They're not, but if we make them the only thing, it's interesting. I, I mean, I was talking with another Dharma friend the other day about this kind of renunciation. Right? When we give up what is not in service of our path. And it can feel really rough, like giving up all these things. Like it just feels very demanding. But this renunciation that comes when we realize oh, that is not the source of my happiness. That actually is like a pit of fire, right? That's when it starts to become a joyful dance and practice, not just this forced, I shouldn't do that. That's kind of against those precepts. And so, yeah, interesting here. And then he goes on. Um, 15 days later, the Buddha gave a Dharma talk um, on, he gives a talk about um, how the bhikkhus live, but then on lay life or lay practitioner life, householders. He told the laity how they could realize true happiness in their daily lives. He reviewed the principles of living for peace in the present, peace for the future. Um, and he said, doo, 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 doo. Um, the monk lives a celibate life in order to enjoy peace and joy in the present moment. Such a life assures future happiness as well. 
But homeless monks are not the only ones who enjoy such happiness. Lay disciples living in their world can follow the principles of the teaching to foster true happiness. First of all, do not let desire for wealth cause you to become consumed by your work, that you prevent happiness for yourself and your family in the present moment. Yeah, right? Just that greed that prevents us from actually enjoying. Happiness is foremost. A look filled with understanding, an accepting smile, a loving word, a meal shared in warmth and awareness are the things which create happiness in the present moment. By nourishing awareness in the present moment, you can avoid causing suffering to yourself and those around you. This is so beautiful, this idea that our full and total joy of the present moment will prevent the suffering of wanting what will come in the future, like the suffering of that, you know? And I think it's really hard because like at a practical level, we have to focus on the future. There's bills to pay, right? Things we need to get done. But that doesn't prevent us from like really like just that savoring of the present moment and feeling the fullness and the wonder. So much of this book has been about just seeing the wonder. There's another passage in here where Ananda, who's the Buddha's attendant for you know over 20 years, he's reflecting on how the Buddha notices the natural beauty everywhere he goes. And is just, you know, awestruck by it in a way that we can forget to do. And that happiness of the present moment can help us kind of balancing out. So he says, by nourishing awareness in the present moment, you avoid causing suffering to yourself and those around you. The way you look at others, your smile and your small acts of caring create happiness. True happiness does not depend on wealth or fame. True happiness can be realized in this life, especially when you observe the following. So he has a list here, you know, Buddhist love lists. Uh, number one, foster relations with people of virtue and avoid the path of degradation. So this one also can be tricky. Um, you know, I, I've talked with a number of people about this before, especially when you are kind of deepening your practice on the path. There can be, you know, these friends or family members from other times in your life where it doesn't really feel like a wholesome connection, right? And we have to balance and figure out when and how do we kind of foster the relationship with people of virtue, with our spiritual friends, our Kalyana Mitra, and, but do so in a way that isn't, you know, harmful and like letting people down. I'd be really curious from folks about your experience with that one. Like, how do you really foster and prioritize kind of what he calls people of virtue? But, you know, he's really saying people who can reflect these same values, right? Of really dedicating your life to compassion, awareness, understanding. How has that showed up for folks? Yes, Lucas. Um, well, I've had, uh, good and bad experiences with this, right. You know, um, so I got, I got sober 11 years ago and, um, I had this, this sponsor, I had, I had a best friend at the time and I was sober and my best friend was not. Mm. And, um, I think he called my sponsor called my best friend, like, like a, like a Judas and that I needed to like throw him off the boat. Right. Wow. And so I did that. I took his advice. And, um, basically up until a couple years ago, this guy like wouldn't talk to me. And it mm -hmm. turns out he's about, he lives about five blocks away from me now. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to sort of like slowly kind of like, you know, re rekindle this friendship. But, um, I would say that that's maybe the wrong way to do things, yeah. right? Um, uh, and then, um, like, as I've kind of, you know, I I've grown a fair amount in the past couple of years, I think mostly because of uh, getting kind of more into Buddhism, and, and, and I think that's really helped. But um, I would say that, like, a lot of my relationships as I've grown in the past couple of years, you know, 
my other friends who kind of were on a similar spiritual path, I would say, but then have remained stagnant, right? I, I think that like, as, as we've maybe grown apart, we've had dialogues around that. Like, how can we, you know, um, if they're feeling like I'm not showing up for them, then we talk about it. Right. And I think that, um, I think that like, that's kind of how I maintain like love from afar. If I need to is like talking about what their needs are and what, and how my needs might be changing. Right. Yeah. And boundaries that we set around certain topics, right. That maybe felt like more fluid, but have now become like a little, uh, you know, and might need, you know, some, some, some walls, some fences or whatever. But, um, yeah, I think there's like a, a communication, right. Um, yeah. and, and I think the main difference was before with that friend that got thrown off the boat, uh, or whatever, um, there was no communication. There was yeah. no, uh, open discussion, um, or continued discussion. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's been helpful, right? It's not make anything, um, you know, so severe yeah. that it can't maybe, uh, come back, right? Like that the, the dialogue can't, uh, be maintained, you know, if, if things change or they grow or whatever. Anyways, I think that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, I mean, with sobriety, I do think one really, should be protective. Um, and so I can understand that inclination, but what I hear you saying also is, you know, when we push someone completely away or just kind of push them outside of our sphere of care, then we're, we've fallen off the path. Right. If we're like, I can hang out those people that, you know, like maybe it's cause there's too much idle chatter. All we ever do is gossip. And, you know, we're trying to practice right speech. I don't want to be gossiping all the time. So I just won't. And there can be like a skillful way still to engage and be compassionate and loving. I think, you know, whoever we encounter in this life, who we end up, you know, having some connection with, according, you don't have to believe this, but according to Buddhism, like we have a, a lifelong contract with them, right? Like that's, they're in our life for a reason. Um, and, you know, they will continue to come back in different lifetimes if we try to diss them in this one. So may as well work it out. And, you know, if you don't believe that, like it's still really positive and helpful to think of, okay, if I push this person away, they come back in a different, because they kind of do, right? Like that energy that we're trying to avoid often re-enters our life through a different person even. So just this idea that, yes, like it is so helpful to be around supportive community so helpful, but not all this way of um, kind of pushing them to the side. And then his, his second advice is live in an environment that's conducive to spiritual practice and builds good character. It's like, yeah, well, you live with your family, right? And, and other people, and like, we can't always control that, you know, but I, I love it. I have a friend who's a practitioner and became a practitioner after she was married and had kids and her altar and Zafu is in her closet. And she just, you know, and I was like, she's like, it's a reasonably big closet. Um, but this idea that that is like the conducive environment space she could etch out for her practice. And it makes a big difference. And, and I like this idea of like in an environment's conducive to spiritual practice, which is everywhere because, you know, we already live in the pure land. It's around us. We just can't see it. But how do we like give ourselves kind of that? Um, yeah, like that, that place. And, you know, I, I will say though, like, can get really contagious. Like I started with like one altar and now there's an altar in every room of my house. So it can go overboard. Um, but it is kind of nice to have those reminders, right? Like just those reminders of practice and, oh, wow, I could sit here and I could sit here and, um, and can be really supportive. Uh, so, and, and, and builds good character. I, I, I'm not sure, but I do think, you know, it's again, we don't always have a choice. Like if we're living near a really busy street, like, yeah, that's kind of agitating. So yeah, 
pieces for pieces for the people. Yeah. I think it's interesting because the Vajrayana church practice yep. is sort of the opposite. Yep. And so yeah so may said she's saying that the vajrayana and especially like the chud practice is a little opposite but i think they're not totally opposite i think again there's a little bit more of that you know um like hinayana push everything that's difficult away energy in this but you know we can transform all the poison into medicine, but maybe we have a nice place to come home to at night that's not a bed of poison, right? Like, I feel like there can still be that concession to have and create a, a place that feels sacred. And, you know, it's interesting the way the bhikkhus lead their life, the monks lead their life, such simplicity, but also such precision. You know, everything is so tidy and nice. So they are also like, I don't know, like they're, so dedicated to their practice but part of the practice is like kind of tending to home and hearth too and he actually says that um and like we'll skip one we'll skip number three but number four is take the time to care well for your parents your spouse your children your friends so like your practice matters but so does caring for the people in your life if you're a lay practitioner so it kind of reminds me of that yeah and then the third is foster opportunities to learn more about the Dharma score. We all did that. We're here. Yes. Uh, the precepts and uh, your own and in your in your own greater depth, right? So how do we make opportunities? This is even before YouTube, right? Like we can endlessly receive teachings now and deepen. And I actually think we have to not go so broad uh, and maybe get deeper because it can be distracting. Um, and then the fifth, share time, resources, and happiness with others. Just so simple and so beautiful, right? Share time, resources, and happiness with others. Six, foster opportunities to cultivate virtue. Avoid alcohol and gambling. I don't know why those two, but there's a lot of in virtue, you know? But, but those are the two that are called out. Yeah. I know they are very old and I, you know, opportunities to cultivate virtue. Um, so again, like being of service, being connected, being in the natural world, right. Feeling the calmness of the natural world and letting that can in cultivate humility, gratitude, and simple living. It's so sweet. And humility, again, like the least popular trait in our contemporary culture, um, but such the natural manifestation of our devotion, right? When we feel devotion in our practice, when we feel the sense of there is something bigger than me moving through me through these teachings, uh, humility arises. Um, and then the gratitude, kind of like the gateway drug to that devotion and humility, just really appreciation, 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 um, and not doing so in kind of a flippant, superficial way, but that gratitude of really seeing interdependence, really knowing that like we only exist because of others. It's a very powerful um, shift of the mind. Seek opportunities to be closer to monks in order to study the way. Live a life based on the Four Noble Truths, which I think, yeah, I think we all, you know, definitely know at least the first two. <laughs> um, learn how to meditate in order to release sorrows and anxieties. So it's really, you know, it's interesting, like, what is the purpose of our meditation? The purpose of meditation is not to become a good meditator, right? It's to, I love this, release the sorrows and anxieties so that what? So we become more available with the kindness and compassion for others. Um, and then there's this really beautiful little passage where a, a one of the lay uh, practitioners there, he says, um, Mm -hmm. kind of asks about like it's really difficult to you know as a important person with a big job essentially uh, I have so like so many responsibilities and the Buddha said everybody has responsibilities uh, but I think that one thing that could really help the laity is twice a month come to the temple and 
Observe all the practices day and night. Eat only one meal, practice sitting and walking meditation for 24 hours. Enjoy celibate, being celibate, aware, concentrated, relaxed, peaceful, and joyous, as if you were a monk or a nun. And I think that two days a month would be fantastic, but I think if all of us could commit even one half day of practice a month, you know, and um, you don't actually have to go to a temple, right? If you can get space in your own home where you can feel undisturbed and just practice for four hours, huge, right? No phone, no computer, just practice. And um, yeah, I, I really think it's such a great way to improve and deepen our practice. So this, like you have a day of practice twice a month um, and to, you know, <clears throat> not, you know, he's saying to do these eight observances. So do not kill, do not steal, do not engage in sexual activity, do not lie, do not use alcohol, do not adorn yourself with jewelry, do not sit or lie on a fancy bed, uh, do not use money. <laughs> no, that one's tough. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's funny because, you know, uh, when I did this Mahasi Sayadaw retreat, literally, it was just like a plank on the ground where you and the idea was to not because, you know, like, in, you know, indulging in your sleep can also be a distraction, I guess. So the idea that it's just like your function. So pretty interesting, but extreme, I, I'd say you can still indulge in your nice bed as long as you're you know connecting with the practice itself um yeah gosh what do i want to share okay so then yeah there's just this really interesting aspect of the end of the buddha's life that i'm sure many of you are familiar with one of his senior students uh devadatta who you know, very early on became someone the Buddha really respected and admired. He became very jealous of the Buddha and he started his own Sangha and it created just unbelievable difficulty. Um, so in the one kingdom of Magda, where Vulture Peak was, where the Buddha spent a lot of time, uh, he, Devadatta, started and his own sangha and he did so in, a, in like a very what's the right word kind of malicious way right he went to one of the buddha's talks and asked the buddha two questions and framed in such a way that made the buddha sound less strict or less clear than devadatta and then he stood up and it claimed the buddha doesn't know the answer to these questions he's not as clear as i am and asked a lot of monks to come with him and it was a source, you know, of great suffering, mostly for the monks and then also for the lay community to have this division. So you had 500 other monks with, you know, this very different, um, this very different kind of approach. And the Buddha was like, as always, you know, let it be like no problem. Like he's allowed to do whatever he wants and kind of very... Um, you know, very uh, open and forgiving. But Sariputta and Moggallana, who are like now the very senior students of the Buddha, they really felt that this was difficult at a level of politics for all everyone involved. Like the lay community didn't know who to give food offerings to. And Devadatta started to get involved in local politics. And it was just very confusing. So Sariputta and Moggallana went um, to Devadatta's um, Sangha and Devadatta assumed, aha, they've come to join me. How wonderful. I've gotten his best students. So every other day, he let Sariputta give the Dharma talk and he gave a beautiful Dharma talk for two weeks, just so beautiful. And, you know, Devadatta is like kind of tired out by all his wheelings and dealings, according to this, right? He's so busy trying to establish himself as more important than the Buddha and you know, influencing all these political um, machinations going on in the kingdom. And then on the very last day, uh, Sariputta says, 
the true teaching and the true teacher is the Buddha. And I'm going back. And so is, uh, you know, Sariput Mogulana and I are going back and you are all welcome. The Buddha will forgive you all. So you are welcome to join. And 500 of them come back. <laughs> right. And so it's just really, you know, interesting. And then this, you know, Devadatta suffers greatly and almost everyone leaves him and he falls out of grace with the politicians and the king. And there's just this beautiful scene. Um, Devadatta becomes very ill and the last four monks who are with him carry him on a stretcher to see the Buddha. And he's lying there and he says, I take refuge in the Buddha. And the Buddha just touches him and that night he dies in peace. So just... Yeah, kind of amazing. Again, like the humanness going on around this unbelievably enlightened being who, you know, people meet him and all of a sudden, like that description that Thich Nhat Hanh uses, their hearts and minds shine, right? Like encountering a true enlightened teacher. And yet there's jealousy, there's divisions, there's conflict, there's pain, which is an interesting aspect of it. So that story time let's uh let's dedicate the merit of our practice hmm. so taking a moment and reconnecting to the body and the breath reconnecting to the preciousness of this moment And if it's comfortable, placing hands together at the chest. And a symbol of offering. And we have a Sangha member, member, beloved Melissa, who just went through a medical procedure and surgery. So if folks would like to bring her to mind and all other beings to mind who could really use our support and care. And dedicating the benefit of our practice so that all beings could know true happiness, be free from suffering. All beings could realize their true nature and feel love and belonging. That all beings could be free. Thank you all. Um, we're going to take a winter break here. So the next two weeks, actually, the 20th and 27th, I'll be on retreat one week and next week out of town. And I don't know, like zooming in, just kind of lame. So yes. <laughs> and I know folks will already be leaving town. Um, on the third, when we come back, we'll do an intention setting ritual here for the new year. So that'll be our... Um, coming coming back into the space it's on the third so i will look forward to seeing folks then and we have some announcements i do oh i had an idea about the dharma talk i'll start with that cup of coffee these days costs seven dollars seven dollars a yoga class costs 25 25 or 30 dollars so like you know Consider that in terms of the exchange and reciprocity here. We really need your support to keep the center open. Um, and we so appreciate the generosity of folks who come. And we think that folks might not quite always take in that we really do need the support. So the kind of um, offerings that we're getting are more like everyone's like paying for half a cup of coffee. <laughs> so your generosity would be so great. It doesn't have to be a yoga class, but somewhere in the middle. Being cool as it was. It was, yeah. Yeah. 